Chapter Two, Part One of the Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 by Friedrich Engels. Chapter Two, The Great Towns. A town such as London, where a man may wander for hours together without reaching the beginning of the end without meeting the slightest hint which could lead to the inference that there is open country within reach, is a strange thing. This colossal centralization, this heaping together of two and a half millions of human beings at one point, has multiplied the power of this two and a half millions a hundredfold, has raised London to the commercial capital of the world, created the giant docks, and assembled the thousand vessels that continually cover the Thames. I know nothing more imposing than the view which the Thames offers during the ascent from the sea to London Bridge. The masses of buildings, the wharves on both sides, especially from Woolwich upwards, the countless ships along both shores, crowding ever closer and closer together, until at last only a narrow passage remains in the middle of the river, a passage through which hundreds of steamers shoot by one another. All this is so vast, so impressive, that a man cannot collect himself but is lost in the marvel of England's greatness before he sets foot upon English soil. But the sacrifices which all this has cost become apparent later. After roaming the streets of the capital a day or two, making headway with difficulty through the human turmoil and the endless lines of vehicles, after visiting the slums of the metropolis, one realizes for the first time that these Londoners have been forced to sacrifice the best qualities of their human nature to bring to pass all the marvels of civilization which crowd their city, that a hundred powers which slumbered within them have remained inactive, have been suppressed in order that a few might be developed more fully and multiply through union with those of others. The very turmoil of the streets has something repulsive, something against which human nature rebels. The hundreds of thousands of all classes and ranks crowding past each other, are they not all human beings with the same qualities and powers, and with the same interest in being happy? And have they not, in the end, to seek happiness in the same way, by the same means? And still they crowd by one another as though they had nothing in common, nothing to do with one another, and their only agreement is the tacit one, that each keep to his own side of the pavement, so as not to delay the opposing streams of the crowd, while it occurs to no man to honour another with so much as a glance. The brutal indifference, the unfeeling isolation of each in his private interest, becomes the more repellent and offensive, the more these individuals are crowded together within a limited space. And however much one may be aware that this isolation of the individual, this narrow self-seeking, is the fundamental principle of our society everywhere, it is nowhere so shamelessly barefaced, so self-conscious as just here in the crowding of the great city. The dissolution of mankind into monads, of which each one has a separate principle, the world of atoms, is here carried out to its utmost extreme. Hence it comes, too, that the social war, the war of each against all, is here openly declared. Just as in Stirner's recent book people regard each other only as useful objects, each exploits the other, and the end of it all is that the stronger treads the weaker underfoot, and that the powerful few, the capitalists, seize everything for themselves, while to the weak many, the poor, scarcely a bare existence remains. What is true of London is true of Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, is true of all great towns. Everywhere barbarous indifference, hard egotism on one hand and nameless misery on the other. Everywhere social warfare, every man's house in a state of siege, everywhere reciprocal plundering under the protection of the law, and all so shameless, so openly avowed, that one shrinks before the consequences of our social state as they manifest themselves here undisguised, and can only wonder that the whole crazy fabric still hangs together. Since capital, the direct or indirect control of the means of subsistence and production, is the weapon with which this social warfare is carried on, it is clear that all the disadvantages of such a state must fall upon the poor. For him no man has the slightest concern. Cast into the whirlpool, he must struggle through as well as he can. If he is so happy as to find work, that is, if the bourgeoisie does him the favour to enrich itself by means of him, wages await him which scarcely suffice to keep body and soul together. If he can get no work, he may steal, if he is not afraid of the police, 
or starve, in which case the police will take care that he does so in a quiet and inoffensive manner. During my residence in England, at least twenty or thirty persons have died of simple starvation under the most revolting circumstances, and a jury has rarely been found possessed of the courage to speak the plain truth in the matter. Let the testimony of the witnesses be never so clear and unequivocal. The bourgeoisie, from which the jury is selected, always finds some back door through which to escape the frightful verdict, death from starvation. The bourgeoisie dare not speak the truth in these cases, for it would speak its own condemnation. But indirectly, far more than directly, many have died of starvation, where long-continued want of proper nourishment has called forth fatal illness, when it has produced such debility that causes which might otherwise have remained inoperative brought on severe illness and death. The English workingmen call this social murder, and accuse our whole society of perpetrating this crime perpetually. Are they wrong? True, it is only individuals who starve, but what security has the working-man that it may not be his turn to-morrow? Who assures him employment, who vouches for it that, if for any reason or no reason his lord and master discharges him to-morrow, he can struggle along with those dependent upon him until he may find some one else to give him bread? Who guarantees that willingness to work shall suffice to obtain work? that uprightness, industry, thrift, and the rest of the virtues recommended by the bourgeoisie are really his road to happiness. No one. He knows that he has something to-day, and that it does not depend upon himself whether he shall have something to-morrow. He knows that every breeze that blows, every whim of his employer, every bad turn of trade may hurl him back into the fierce whirlpool from which he has temporarily saved himself and in which it is hard and often impossible to keep his head above water. He knows that, though he may have the means of living to-day, it is very uncertain whether he shall to-morrow. Meanwhile, let us proceed to a more detailed investigation of the position in which the social war has placed the non-possessing class. Let us see what pay for his work society does give the working man in the form of dwelling, clothing, food, what sort of subsistence it grants those who contribute most to the maintenance of society. And first, let us consider the dwellings. Every great city has one or more slums, where the working class is crowded together. True, poverty often dwells in hidden alleys close to the palaces of the rich, but in general a separate territory has been assigned to it, where, removed from the sight of the happier classes, it may struggle along as it can. These slums are pretty equally arranged in all the great towns of England, the worst houses in the worst quarters of the towns, usually one or two-storied cottages in long rows, perhaps with cellars used as dwellings, almost always irregularly built. These houses of three or four rooms and a kitchen form throughout England, some parts of London excepted, the general dwellings of the working class. The streets are generally unpaved, rough, dirty, filled with vegetable and animal refuse, without sewers or gutters but supplied with foul stagnant pools instead. Moreover, ventilation is impeded by the bad, confused method of building of the whole quarter, and since many human beings here live crowded into a small space, the atmosphere that prevails in these working men's quarters may readily be imagined. Further, the streets serve as drying grounds in fine weather, lines are stretched across from house to house and hung with wet clothing. Let us investigate some of the slums in their order. London comes first, and in London the famous rookery of St. Giles, which is now, at last, about to be penetrated by a couple of broad streets. St. Giles is in the midst of the most populous part of the town, surrounded by broad, splendid avenues in which the gay world of London idles about, in the immediate neighbourhood of Oxford Street, Regent Street, of Trafalgar Square, and the Strand. It is a disorderly collection of tall, three- or four-storied houses, with narrow, crooked, filthy streets, in which there is quite as much life as in the great thoroughfares of the town, except that here people of the working class only are to be seen. A vegetable market is held in the street, baskets with vegetables and fruits, naturally all bad and hardly fit to use, obstruct the sidewalk still further, and from these, as well as from the fish-dealers' stalls, arises a horrible smell. The houses are occupied from cellar to garret, filthy within and without and their appearance is such that no human being could possibly wish to live in them. But all this is nothing in comparison with the dwellings in the narrow courts and alleys between the streets, 
entered by covered passages between the houses in which the filth and tottering ruins surpass all description scarcely a whole window-pane can be found the walls are crumbling door-posts and window-frames loose and broken doors of old boards nailed together or altogether wanting in this thieves quarter where no doors are needed there being nothing to steal heaps of garbage and ashes lie in all directions and the foul liquids emptied before the doors gather in stinking pools here live the poorest of the poor the worst paid workers with thieves and the victims of prostitution indiscriminately huddled together the majority irish or of irish extraction and those who have not yet sunk in the whirlpool of moral ruin which surrounds them sinking daily deeper losing daily more and more of their power to resist the demoralizing influence of want filth and evil surroundings nor is st giles the only london slum in the immense tangle of streets there are hundreds and thousands of alleys and courts lined with houses too bad for any one to live in who can still spend anything whatsoever upon a dwelling fit for human beings close to the splendid houses of the rich such a lurking place of the bitterest poverty may often be found so a short time ago on the occasion of a coroner's inquest a region close to portman square one of the very respectable squares was characterized as an abode quote, of a multitude of irish demoralized by poverty and filth end quote. so too may be found in streets such as long acre and others which though not fashionable are yet quote, unquote, respectable a great number of cellar dwellings out of which puny children and half-starred ragged women emerge into the light of day in the immediate neighbourhood of drury lane theatre the second in london are some of the worst streets of the whole metropolis charles king and park streets in which the houses are inhabited from cellar to garret exclusively by poor families in the parishes of st john and st margaret there lived in eighteen forty according to the journal of the statistical society five thousand three hundred and sixty six working men's families in five thousand two hundred and ninety four dwellings if they deserve the name men women and children thrown together without distinction of age or sex twenty six thousand eight hundred and thirty persons all told and of these families three quarters possessed but one room in the aristocratic parish of st george hanover square there lived according to the same authority one thousand four hundred and sixty five working men's families nearly six thousand persons under similar conditions and here, too, more than two-thirds of the whole number crowded together at the rate of one family in one room. And how the poverty of these unfortunates, among whom even thieves find nothing to steal, is exploited by the property-holding class in lawful ways. The abominable dwellings in Drury Lane, just mentioned, bring in the following rents. Two cellar dwellings, three shillings. One room, ground floor, four shillings. Second story, four shillings, sixpence third floor four shillings garret room three shillings weekly so that the starving occupants of charles street alone pay the house owners a yearly tribute of two thousand pounds and the five thousand three hundred and thirty six families above mentioned in westminster a yearly rent of forty thousand pounds the most extensive working people's district lies east of the tower in whitechapel and bethnal green where the greatest masses of london working people live let us hear Mr. G. Alston, preacher of St. Philip's, Bethnal Green, on the condition of his parish. He says, quote, It contains 1,400 houses, inhabited by 2,795 families, or about 12,000 persons. The space upon which this large population dwells is less than 400 yards, or 1,200 feet, square, and in this overcrowding it is nothing unusual to find a man, his wife, four or five children, and sometimes both grandparents, all in one single room, where they eat, sleep, and work. I believe that before the Bishop of London called attention to this most poverty-stricken parish, people at the West End knew as little of it as of the savages of Australia or of the South Sea Isles. And if we make ourselves acquainted with these unfortunates through personal observation, if we watch them at their scanty meal and see them bowed by illness and want of work, we shall find such a mass of helplessness and misery that a nation like ours must blush that these things can be possible. I was rector near Huddersfield during the three years in which the mills were at their worst, but I have never seen such complete helplessness of the poor as since then in Bethnal Green. Not one father of a family in ten in the whole neighbourhood has other clothing than his working suit, 
and that is as bad and tattered as possible. Many, indeed, have no other covering for the night than these rags, and no bed save a sack of straw and shavings. End quote. The foregoing description furnishes an idea of the aspect of the interior of the dwellings. But let us follow the English officials, who occasionally stray thither into one or two of these working men's homes. On the occasion of an inquest held November 14, 1843, by Mr. Carter, coroner for Surrey, upon the body of Anne Galway, aged forty-five years, the newspapers related the following particulars concerning the deceased. She had lived at number 3 White Lion Court, Bermondsey Street, London, with her husband and a nineteen-year-old son in a little room, in which neither a bedstead nor any other furniture was to be seen. She lay dead beside her son upon a heap of feathers, which were scattered over her almost naked body, there being neither sheet nor coverlet. The feathers stuck so fast over the whole body that the physician could not examine the corpse until it was cleansed, and then found it starved and scarred from the bites of vermin. Part of the floor of the room was torn up, and the whole used by the family as a privy. On Monday, January 15, 1844, two boys were brought before the police magistrate because, being in a starving condition, they had stolen and immediately devoured a half-cooked calf's foot from a shop. The magistrate felt called upon to investigate the case further, and received the following details from the policeman. The mother of the two boys was the widow of an ex-soldier, afterwards policeman, and had had a very hard time since the death of her husband to provide for her nine children. She lived at number 2 Pools Place, Quaker Court, Spitalsfields, in the utmost poverty. When the policeman came to her, he found her with six of her children literally huddled together in a little back room, with no furniture but two old rush-bottomed chairs with the seats gone, a small table with two legs broken, a broken cup, and a small dish. On the hearth was scarcely a spark of fire, and in one corner lay as many old rags as would fill a woman's apron, which served the whole family as a bed. For bed-clothing they had only their scanty day-clothing. The poor woman told him that she had been forced to sell her bedstead the year before to buy food. Her bedding she had pawned with the victualler for food. In short, everything had gone for food. The magistrate ordered the woman a considerable provision from the poor-box. In February 1844, Teresa Bishop, a widow sixty years old, was recommended, with her sick daughter, aged twenty-six, to the compassion of the police magistrate in Marlborough Street. She lived at number 5 Brown Street, Grosvenor Square, in a small back room no larger than a closet, in which there was not one single piece of furniture. In one corner lay some rags upon which both slept. A chest served as table and chair. The mother earned a little by charring. The owner of the house said that they had lived in this way since May 1843, had gradually sold or pawned everything that they had, and had still never paid any rent. The magistrate assigned them one pound from the poor box. I am far from asserting that all London working people live in such want as the foregoing three families. I know very well that ten are somewhat better off, where one is so totally trodden underfoot by society. But I assert that thousands of industrious and worthy people, far worthier and more to be respected than all the rich of London, do find themselves in a condition unworthy of human beings, and that every proletarian, every one, without exception, is exposed to a similar fate without any fault of his own and in spite of every possible effort. But in spite of all this, they who have some kind of a shelter are fortunate, fortunate in comparison with the utterly homeless. In London fifty thousand human beings get up every morning not knowing where they are to lay their heads at night. The luckiest of this multitude, those who succeed in keeping a penny or two until evening, enter a lodging-house such as abound in every great city, where they find a bed. But what a bed! These houses are filled with beds from cellar to garret, four, five, six beds in a room, as many as can be crowded in. Into every bed four, five, or six human beings are piled, as many as can be packed in, sick and well, young and old, drunk and sober, men and women, just as they come, indiscriminately. Then come strife, blows, wounds, or if these bedfellows agree, so much the worse. Thefts are arranged, and things done which our language, grown more humane than our deeds, refuses to record. And those who cannot pay for such a refuge? 
they sleep where they find a place in passages arcades in corners where the police and the owners leave them undisturbed a few individuals find their way to the refuges which are managed here and there by private charity others sleep on the benches in the parks close under the windows of queen victoria let us hear the london times Quote, it appears from the report of the proceedings at marlborough street police court in our columns of yesterday that there is an average number of fifty human beings of all ages who huddle together in the parks every night having no other shelter than what is supplied by the trees and a few hollows of the embankment of these the majority are young girls who have been seduced from the country by the soldiers and turned loose on the world in all the destitution of friendless penury and all the recklessness of early vice this is truly horrible poor there must be everywhere indigence will find its way and set up its hideous state in the heart of a great and luxurious city amid the thousand narrow lanes and by-streets of a populous metropolis there must always we fear be much suffering much that offends the eye much that lurks unseen but that within the precincts of wealth gaiety and fashion nigh the regal grandeur of st james close on the palatial splendour of bayswater on the confines of the old and new aristocratic quarters in a district where the cautious refinement of modern design has refrained from creating one single tenement for poverty which seems as it were dedicated to the exclusive enjoyment of the wealth that there want and famine and disease and vice should stalk in all their kindred horrors consuming body by body soul by soul it is indeed a monstrous state of things enjoyment the most absolute that bodily ease intellectual excitement or the more innocent pleasures of sense can supply to man's craving brought in close contact with the most unmitigated misery wealth from its bright saloons laughing an insolently heedless laugh at the unknown wounds of want pleasure cruelly but unconsciously mocking the pain that moans below all contrary things mocking one another all contrary save the vice which tempts and the vice which is tempted but let all men remember this that within the most courtly precincts of the richest city of god's earth there may be found night after night winter after winter women young in years old in sin and suffering outcasts from society rotting from famine filth and disease let them remember this and learn not to theorize but to act god knows there is much room for action nowadays i have referred to the refuges for the homeless how greatly overcrowded these are two examples may show a newly erected refuge for the houseless in upper ogle street that can shelter three hundred persons every night has received since its opening january twenty seventh to march seventeenth eighteen forty four two thousand seven hundred forty persons for one or more nights and although the season was growing more favourable the number of applicants in this as well as in the asylums of whitecross street and wapping was strongly on the increase and a crowd of the homeless had to be sent away every night for want of room in another refuge the central asylum and playhouse yard there were supplied on an average four hundred and sixty beds nightly during the first three months of the year eighteen forty four six thousand six hundred and eighty one persons being sheltered and ninety six thousand one hundred and forty one portions of bread were distributed yet the committee of directors declare this institution began to meet the pressure of the needy to a limited extent only when the eastern asylum was also opened let us leave london and examine the other great cities of the three kingdoms in their order let us take dublin first a city the approach to which from the sea is as charming as that of london is imposing the bay of dublin is the most beautiful of the whole british island kingdom and is even compared by the irish with the bay of naples the city too possesses great attractions and its aristocratic districts are better and more tastefully laid out than those of any other british city by way of compensation however the poorer districts of dublin are among the most hideous and repulsive to be seen in the world true the irish character which under some circumstances is comfortable only in the dirt has some share in this but as we find thousands of irish in every great city in england and scotland and as every poor population must gradually sink into the same uncleanliness the wretchedness of dublin is nothing specific nothing peculiar to dublin but something common to all great towns the poor quarters of dublin are extremely extensive and the filth the uninhabitableness of the houses 
and the neglect of the streets surpass all description some idea of the manner in which the poor are here crowded together may be formed from the fact that in eighteen seventeen according to the report of the inspector of workhouses one thousand three hundred eighteen persons lived in fifty-two houses with three hundred and ninety rooms in Barrel Street, and one thousand nine hundred and ninety-seven persons in seventy-one houses with three hundred and ninety-three rooms in and near Church Street that, quote, in this and the adjoining district there exists a multitude of foul courts and alleys. Many cellars receive all their light through the door, while in not a few the inhabitants sleep upon the bare floor, though most of them possess bedsteads at least. Nicholson's Court, for example, contains twenty-eight wretched little rooms with one hundred and fifty-one human beings in the greatest want, there being but two bedsteads and two blankets to be found in the whole court. The poverty is so great in Dublin that a single benevolent institution, the Mendicity Association, gives relief to two thousand five hundred persons, or one per cent of the population, daily, receiving and feeding them for the day and dismissing them at night. Dr. Allison describes a similar state of things in Edinburgh, whose superb situation, which has won it the title of the modern Athens, and whose brilliant aristocratic quarter in the new town, contrasts strongly with the foul wretchedness of the poor in the old town. Allison asserts that this extensive quarter is as filthy and horrible as the worst district of Dublin, while the Mendicity Association would have as great a proportion of needy persons to assist in Edinburgh as in the Irish capital. He asserts, indeed, that the poor in Scotland, especially in Edinburgh and Glasgow, are worse off than in any other region of the three kingdoms, and that the poorest are not Irish but Scotch. The preacher of the old church of Edinburgh, Dr. Lee, testified in 1836 before the Commission of Religious Instruction that, quote, he had never before seen such misery as in his parish, where the people were without furniture, without everything, two married couples often sharing one room. In a single day he had visited seven houses in which there was not a bed, in some of them not even a heap of straw. Old people of eighty years sleep on the board floor, nearly all slept in their day-clothes. In one cellar-room he found two families from a Scotch country district. Soon after their removal to the city two of the children had died, and a third was dying at the time of his visit. Each family had a filthy pile of straw lying in a corner. The cellar sheltered, besides the two families, a donkey, and was, moreover, so dark that it was impossible to distinguish one person from another by day. Dr. Lee declared that it was enough to make a heart of adamant bleed to see such misery in a country like Scotland. In the Edinburgh Medical and Surgical Journal, Dr. Hennan reports a similar state of things. From a parliamentary report, it is evident that in the dwellings of the poor of Edinburgh, a want of cleanliness reigns, such as must be expected under these conditions. On the bedposts chickens roost at night, dogs and horses share the dwellings of human beings, and the natural consequence is a shocking stench, with filth and swarms of vermin. The prevailing construction of Edinburgh favours these atrocious conditions as far as possible. The old town is built upon both slopes of a hill, along the crest of which runs the high street. Out of the high street there open downwards multitudes of narrow, crooked alleys, called wines from their many turnings, and these wines form the proletarian district of the city. The houses of the Scotch cities, in general, are five- or six-storied buildings, like those of Paris, and in contrast with England, where, so far as possible, each family has a separate house. The crowding of human beings upon a limited area is thus intensified. Quote, these streets, says an English journal in an article upon the sanitary condition of the working people in cities, are often so narrow that a person can step from the window of one house into that of its opposite neighbour, while the houses are piled so high, story upon story, that the light can scarcely penetrate into the court or alley that lies between. In this part of the city there are neither sewers nor other drains, nor even privies belonging to the houses. In consequence, all refuse, garbage, and excrements of at least fifty thousand persons are thrown into the gutters every night, so that in spite of all street-sweeping a mass of dried filth and foul vapours are created which not only offend the sight and smell, but endanger the health of the inhabitants in the highest degree. Is it to be wondered at that in such localities all considerations of health, morals, and even the most ordinary decency are utterly neglected? 
on the contrary all who are more intimately acquainted with the condition of the inhabitants will testify to the high degree which disease wretchedness and demoralization have here reached society in such districts has sunk to a level indescribably low and hopeless the houses of the poor are generally filthy and are evidently never cleansed they consist in most cases of a single room which while subject to the worst ventilation is yet usually kept cold by the broken and badly fitting windows and is sometimes damp and partly below ground level always badly furnished and thoroughly uncomfortable a straw heap often serving the whole family for a bed upon which men and women young and old sleep in revolting confusion water can be had only from the public pumps and the difficulty of obtaining it naturally fosters all possible filth End quote. In the other great seaport towns the prospect is no better. Liverpool, with all its commerce, wealth, and grandeur, yet treats its workers with the same barbarity. A full fifth of the population, more than forty-five thousand human beings, live in narrow, dark, damp, badly ventilated cellar dwellings, of which there are seven thousand eight hundred and sixty-two in the city. Besides these cellar dwellings there are two thousand two hundred and seventy courts, small spaces built up on all four sides, and having but one entrance, a narrow, covered passageway, the whole ordinarily very dirty and inhabited exclusively by proletarians. Of such courts we shall have more to say when we come to Manchester. In Bristol, on one occasion, 2,800 families were visited, of whom 46% occupied but one room each. Precisely the same state of things prevails in the factory towns. In Nottingham there are in all 11,000 houses, of which between 7,000 and 8,000 are built back to back, with a rear party wall so that no through ventilation is possible, while a single privy usually serves for several houses. During an investigation made a short time since, many rows of houses were found to have been built over shallow drains, covered only by the boards of the ground floor. In Leicester, Derby, and Sheffield it is no better. Of Birmingham, the article above cited from the artisan states, quote, in the older quarters of the city there are many bad districts, filthy and neglected, full of stagnant pools and heaps of refuse. Courts are very numerous in Birmingham, reaching two thousand, and containing the greater number of the working people of the city. These courts are usually narrow, muddy, badly ventilated, ill-drained, and lined with eight to twenty houses, which, by reason of having their rear walls in common, can usually be ventilated from one side only. In the background, within the court, there is usually an ash-heap or something of the kind, the filth of which cannot be described. It must, however, be observed that the newer courts are more sensibly built and more decently kept, and that even in the old ones the cottages are much less crowded than in Manchester and Liverpool, wherefore Birmingham shows even during the reign of an epidemic a far smaller mortality than, for instance, Wolverhampton, Dudley, and Bilston, only a few miles distant. Cellar dwellings are unknown, too, in Birmingham, though a few cellars are misused as workrooms. The lodging-houses for proletarians are rather numerous, over four hundred, chiefly in courts in the heart of the town. They are nearly all disgustingly filthy and ill-smelling, the refuge of beggars, thieves, tramps, and prostitutes who eat, drink, smoke, and sleep here without the slightest regard to comfort or decency, in an atmosphere endurable to these degraded beings only." End of chapter 1, part 1